Jeremy Wooding, welcome to Fright Fest. Hi. Is this your first time to the festival? Uh, first time as a filmmaker. Uh, third time um, after being in the audience twice before. Yeah. You're here with your first horror film, Blood Moon. Yeah. It's a, a gothic western. Uh, it's an interesting western. This is your first horror project. You've been known for comedy. So what made you decide to make a move into horror? Uh, well, I've always been interested in horror as a teenager. Um, growing up with Hammer Horror movies and uh, making plastic airfix kits of Frankenstein and Mummy. So it's always <laughs> been around in my childhood, as it were. I made a short film, which was a vampire comedy, uh, over ten years ago. So that was really my first step into, uh, into the horror genre. Um, this one uh, came almost inadvertently from uh, the scriptwriter Alan Whiteman, who I was working on another film with, and he said, oh, just read this... Uh, Western that I've written, see what you think. And I went, oh, this is really good and it's got a good sense of humour. I think I can do something with this. And, uh, and that was three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the film. It's set in Colorado. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in the 1880s. It's, yeah. it's, it's in the American West. But there is a, there's a monster on the list. Yeah, it's set in 1887, um, Colorado, but filmed in Kent. And... Uh, Mostly English actors. Uh, it's a it's a period piece, and it has a uh, werewolf-like creature running around um, who is known as a skinwalker. And the skinwalker legend comes from Navajo legends of um, a wolf-like beast um, who would kill settlers and Indians alike. So that's our creature on the loose, um, and it's a stagecoach full of travellers. Six travellers in this stagecoach who arrive at a deserted silver mining town and they get taken captive by a couple of outlaws who are on the run and um, gradually they realise that uh, there's a bigger danger outside as this creature comes closer. <laughs> to my memory, this, this is probably the first horror western. We've got From Dusk Till Dawn, which mm. has the horror element, but that's not really a western that's set in modern times. Do you know of any others? I've, I've, I've had a look around, I couldn't come across any. Well, it, it, it comes out of the genre of the comic book genre of weird westerns. Um, so, other comic books that have been weird western comic books that have been turned into films would be The Wild Wild West with uh, Will Smith and also Cowboys vs. Aliens with Daniel Craig. Um, so, there is a tradition going back, a comic book tradition going back into the 1930s. So it has been out there, and you'll find werewolf westerns out there, vampire westerns out there in, in uh, graphic novel, comic book terms. Mm. Um, as far as we a werewolf western in this country goes, I think the first, um, the first western per se since Carry On Cowboy, 1966. <laughs> um, and yeah, um, I know of a couple of zombie westerns. I mean, Gallo Walkers, I suppose, mm. is a zombie western. Uh, but I think it, it was probably a first in this country. Uh, and what particular challenges did you face shooting a, an American Western in Kent? Uh, the weather in February, because as you probably remember, February was like floods and downpours. And so our, our Western town, which was an already built town um, from a reenactment Western society, they'd been building it over 40 years, so they allowed us to use it as our back lot. Um, in February, it chucked it down and turned it into a quagmire. So we were, it was like the song, you know, we were walking through more than ankle deep, I mean calf deep mud, and it had a huge knock-on effect with getting costumes clean, slowing down, shooting. You know, when I first saw it, it was like the, the, the street through the town was firm, and then it just never was again. <laughs> <laughs> so the weather was tough um, and also had a knock-on effect with the creature because the creature was designed to be able to move across firm ground. When it was wet and soggy, the creature couldn't move around. So I had to rethink how I was going to shoot the creature. Yeah, that, that leads on to my next question. You, you keep the monster hidden for most of the film. Mm. It's a long tradition of that, of course. Indeed, and uh, as we know from... Jaws and from Alien, uh, you arrive on set and your creature arrives and you suddenly realise it's a rubber shark or, um, you know, in Alien, it's like, oh, we don't want to show too much of that because it's a bloke in a suit. Inevitably, unless you're doing CGI afterwards, you're dealing with a physical reality on set. 
and those physical realities often don't move the way you want them to move. <laughs> Um, so it, it took a lot of figuring out how we were going to film it, how it could move around. And Ian White, to, who plays the skinwalker, who is our eight foot six inches werewolf, uh, he's seven foot one anyway. And so he's a big guy to move around when he's threatening to fall over, slip over each step he takes. So, um, so that was, you know, quite demanding, but, you know, it just... You, you think on your feet and come up with a way of getting around it and yeah inevitably when you're in the edit suite you start taking the creature out of the movie because you realise that less is more mm. yeah I mean you know having a big reveal at the end is often has more impact yeah um, or not I mean uh, <laughs> this is the, the big thing with creature features you know how how much um, do you reveal how much does the audience want to see the creature early on or some signs of the creature early on to, to keep them with the movie. Um, before I shot it, I spoke to a distributor, a German distributor actually, and he said, unless you've got a killing in the first 10 minutes and see what the creature does killing-wise, you'll lose your Japanese and South Korean buyers straight away. So I <laughs> bore that in mind. <laughs> Yeah, and you mentioned CGI. I didn't actually notice any CGI in the film. Well, the creature is um, nice up a little bit afterwards with CGI, just making the eyes move and the lips and the jaw move a little bit more. Um, obviously, our post-production budget was limited, so there's only a certain amount we could do. Um, but I knew we'd have to um, enhance the creature a little bit in, in post-production. Mm. Uh, and plus the other CGI that... Uh, was involved was a set extension from the western town um, getting painting out things like crocodile clips that were stuck on the side of the stagecoach you know mad things like that that always get missed <laughs> um, and, and kind of how difficult was it casting um, British actors who could do convincing American accents well um, that's a good question we, we have two American actors in, in the film Corey Johnson um, who's known and Captain Phillips, and mm -hmm. uh, an American actor who lives here. Uh, he's our only uh, American actor from the lead cast. He was great to have on set because, you know, he obviously was our American ear amongst the others. But all the English actors that we cast all had their own um, voice coaches, and they were all totally up for, you know, doing American accents. And when, when I talked to them first, when they offered them the roles, I'd say, you know, does this phase you? Are you up for um, going for this? And they all did a great job. Yeah, they all totally up for it. Interestingly yeah. enough, when we showed the, um, the, the film as a work in progress at the Cannes Film Festival, uh, we totally passed muster with the Americans. And they asked who were the American actors and where did we shoot it in America? So that was like a huge relief. <laughs> Yeah. We're, see, we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of British actors playing Americans now. I mean, Fright Fest opened with the guest. Oh, yeah. Dan now, I didn't even know who Dan Stevens was before I saw the film. When I saw the film, I thought he was American. And someone told me afterwards, no, he's a Brit, he's in Downton Abbey, which, of course, I've never seen, so I didn't know who he was. Well, indeed. Uh, um, uh, I mean, Anna Skellen, who's an Australian actress who lives in mm. London, she, she also plays an American in the movie. Um, but she'd lived in America for several years, so it was like... She said to me, well, which accent would you like, you know? And I said, well, could we do Colorado borders of New Mexico, or whatever? And she's like, yeah, sure, that would sound like this. Um, one of the other actresses uh, found a woman who came from Colorado and lives in London, and she coached her in the accent. So, um, they, you know, there's a lot of commitment to getting it right. And also it's a great calling card for them because, like you say, there's a lot of uh, English actors now picking up American work. Mm, particularly in superhero films. Yeah, <laughs> yes. And finally, uh, what's your next project going to be? You know, stick with horror or go back to comedy? Or well, something uh, really different? the next project will probably be um, a supernatural slasher movie. Again, with a, with a good sense of humour. Um, that's on the cards at the moment, but something else might, might come up as well. Juggling several projects. Um, yeah, I've got a bit of a taste for blood now. <laughs> and uh, and I think also as you as as you get used to uh, you know dealing with levels of tension and and frights etc. It teaches you quite a lot. And you think oh yeah okay I'll see if I can do that better next time or whatever. <laughs> oh so we might see you at Friday next year. 
Well, I hope so, yeah. Thanks, Jeremy. You're welcome. Thank you.